Okay, I guess we should start. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, as it now just is, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, IISS. Um, I'm Nigel Inkster. I'm the D uh, Director of Transnational Threats and uh, Political Risk um, at the Institute. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be chairing and moderating uh, this um, session for which we have uh, two speakers. The first uh, is Professor Aaron Friedberg of the Woodrow Wilson School at uh, Princeton University, um, who, um, who has written a book which I'm sure many, if not all of you, will by now have read, A Contest for Supremacy, which looks at uh, the uh, nexus of relationships between uh, China and the United States and asks, uh, I think it's fair to say, some uh, inconvenient but uh, necessary policy questions about uh, um, how this relationship uh, might evolve. Our other speaker, Charles Grant, a, a very uh, long-standing friend of uh, IISS who runs the uh, Center for European Reform um, here in London. I was just saying to Charles, I, I'm amazed that uh, with the way things are in Europe that he can actually take time out to talk about uh, uh, anything other than uh, the, the, the impending Euro train wreck, but I'm extremely glad that he has, uh, has done so. Thank you very much. For, thanks to both of you for coming. Um, I have suggested, or I would have suggested if I'd spoken to Charles before, that uh, uh, each of our speakers would uh, speak for around uh, 10 minutes, and then I would uh, try to you know, open uh, the floor up uh, for discussion and comment. So on that basis, I'll turn to um, Aaron first. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for coming. It's a real pleasure for me to be back here uh, at the Institute. Uh, I thought what I might try to do is just to summarize very briefly some of the arguments that I make in the book, and then, of course, uh, I'm eager for uh, the discussion that we might have and, and interested in hearing your views. Uh, the relationship between the United States and China today is obviously mixed. It contains elements of cooperation as well as competition. My own view is that the cooperative elements in the relationship are not, on, on closer inspection, are not as large or as significant as their sometimes made out to be. Mm -hmm. I would also say mm -hmm. that the competitive aspects of the relationship are not simply the result of misperception or misunderstanding or misplaced policies, as they're sometimes described as being, but rather spring from quite deep roots. And I would identify two. On the one hand, traditional <coughs> dynamics of power politics. The United States has for a long time been the dominant power, certainly in Asia. China is a rapidly rising power. Historically, that's been a formula, not necessarily for conflict, but for mistrust and for rivalry. And I think some of what we see uh, unfolding in this part of the world is the result of those traditional dynamics. I do think there's also an ideological element to uh, the tensions and rivalry between the United States and China. Uh, it's often said that China is no longer a communist country, therefore there's no basis for ideological friction. Uh, and while it may be true that China's leaders are no longer Marxists, I think it is still very much the case that they're Leninists, by which I mean they're committed to the continued rule uh, of one party and they're determined to maintain it. And in part, as a result, they see the United States as a threat, not only from a geopolitical point of view, but from a political and ideological perspective. They believe that the United States is committed in the long run to transforming the character of their domestic political regime, and in a sense, they're right. Uh, the United States and China, I would say, have over the last 20 years, or really since the end of the Cold War, been pursuing rather consistent strategies towards one another. Despite all of the debate in the United States about whether our policy is too hard or too soft, really since the George H.W. Bush administration down to the current administration, U.S. strategy has sought to combine two elements. On the one hand, engagement economic, diplomatic, cultural, scientific desire to draw China in as much as possible. Uh, and the goal of that aspect of U.S. policy, I think, has been uh, to uh, encourage China to be, as the previous administration said, a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Uh, but I think it's true also in the long run that the objective of U.S. policy has been to encourage, albeit indirectly, uh, trends that will lead eventually to political 
civilization in China. So the United States has sought to engage, but it has also sought to maintain a balance, a balance of power in the Western Pacific that's favorable to the interests of the United States and of its democratic allies and friends in the region. Uh, we've built up our own military capabilities in the region. We've sought to maintain and strengthen our alliances with our traditional alliance partners like Japan and Korea and Australia. And in the last 20 years, we've also entered into closer relations with what I would call quasi-alliance partners, countries with whom we don't have defense treaties but who share with the United States a variety of interests, including a desire to maintain a balance of power in the region that's favorable to their interests. And I would include in that category Singapore on, on one end of the spectrum and India on the other. China, too, I think, has been pursuing a fairly consistent strategy, again, since the early 1990s. And I would describe it as consisting of three elements. One, uh, avoid confrontation. In particular, avoid confrontation with the United States. This may be starting to change, but I think overall the view uh, at the top levels of China's leadership has been that there is nothing to be gained by confrontation with the U.S. or with other powers, and there's everything to be gained by maintaining a stable uh, situation in the region, in part because it's very conducive to economic uh, relations and to, to growth. The second aspect of China's strategy has been to build comprehensive national power. It's a term that Chinese analysts use to refer to the whole panoply of instruments of, of power, economic first and foremost, but also military, diplomatic, political, soft power, and so on. Uh, the belief has been, and again, this may be starting to change, that China was in a position of relative weakness and needed time, decades, to build up its comprehensive national power. The third element of this strategy, I would sum up with the phrase, advance incrementally. I think China's leaders and strategists have seen their country as being on the defensive strategically in relation to the United States and other democratic countries, <laughs> which it saw as relatively stronger. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they've believed that they could or should be passive. They've sought wherever they can to expand their influence, not surprising, and I think also to where they can to undermine the influence and the presence of the United States. What's the goal of this strategy? Well, I, I don't know, and I don't think anybody else does, including, I think, uh, some of the Chinese leaders. There may be disagreement among them about exactly where this is heading. Uh, if I had to bet, I would say that if the current regime and its lineal descendants continues to rule, the objectives of China's strategy will be as follows. First and foremost, to maintain CCP control. I think that that, at the moment, is the fundamental principle that underpins all aspects of Chinese policy, foreign and domestic. Secondly, uh, in a sense, to make the world safe for authoritarianism, or really to make Asia safe for a continued CCP-ruled China. And third, as part of that, or as an extension of that, uh, to, over time, displace the United States as the preponderant power in Asia, particularly in East Asia. Uh, I think from a Chinese perspective, the United States is an interloper in the region. It's a relatively recent arrival. Its position in the region is dependent on what, from a Chinese perspective, are a set of unequal treaties with Japan and others. And then in the long run, they would like to see the United States gone. Uh, and this would allow China to resume its position as the preponderant power in the region. I don't have time to give you my view of where this all stands. Uh, I think it's a mixed uh, picture if you look at the different aspects of, of the competition that are underway. Uh, certainly the United States has not succeeded in transforming China. The CCP continues to rule. They have all kinds of headaches and concerns and their worries about domestic stability, but they're still in, in control. Whether or not the United States has brought China into a position where it is a responsible stakeholder in the international system is, I think, open to debate. My own view is, as I mentioned, if you look carefully at areas where there is supposed to be a great deal of cooperation, there's often less there than meets the eye. One example of that would be on nuclear nonproliferation. The United States has sought, and many in the U.S. have believed, that China would be very helpful, for example, in discouraging North Korea from acquiring nuclear weapons, and that has not worked out very well. And there are some people who expect and hope that China will be very helpful in preventing Iran from getting nuclear weapons, and I suspect they're going to be disappointed in that regard as well. Uh, it's not because China wants nuclear, uh, nuclear proliferation, but rather because it has other interests that it ranks more highly than preventing these countries from getting nuclear weapons, in the case of Iran, maintaining access 
to energy. Uh, one area that's, I think, of particular concern and I think of growing concern in the United States, at least in some sectors, uh, is the military balance. China has been engaged in a 20-year long buildup of its military capabilities, focused, it's increasingly clear, not on trying to match the United States plane for plane and ship for ship, but rather on implementing what Pentagon planners refer to as an asymmetric strategy, emphasizing access, uh, anti-access area denial capabilities that would make it very difficult for the United States to project military power into the region. Uh, and those trends, I think, are increasingly troublesome, uh, and n there needs to be some response to them. Uh, however, at the moment, uh, the United States, like other countries <coughs> in the world, not only in Europe but in parts of Asia too, finds itself heavily constrained uh, by its fiscal problems. Uh, so I think maybe I should stop with that. Uh, I some thoughts on the current administration and where it's going, uh, but perhaps we can get to that yeah. discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Charles. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, I've only read the first 20 pages of Aaron's book, uh, <laughs> but it's, it, they're very good indeed, and I look forward to reading the, reading the rest. Um, a few remarks on the sort of European approach to this. Well, I mean, the, I have to say, obviously, I'm afraid the Europeans are not going to take Asian security very seriously. Uh, it's not on the agenda of many European governments. And in a sense, they're right not to take it seriously because Europe's resources and energy for thinking about strategic questions is so limited that I think they are right, European leaders, to focus rather more on the neighborhood. That is the eastern neighborhood, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, Moldova, and the north uh, and the south Caucasus, and then the the Mediterranean neighborhood, because that, those are parts of the world where the EU can sometimes make a difference, uh, where the US expects Europe to lead, and where we have a very direct interest in that if, if we have states failing in our neighborhood, then we will be affected by the consequent crime, terrorism, migration, uh, need for humanitarian relief, or whatever. So I think most European governments probably think the neighborhood is more important a priority than thinking about Asia strategically. And I think that's probably right, though I wish we could have time and energy and money to do both. Um, anyway, even if we wanted to take Asian security seriously, I mean, the fact is, that, as uh, Bob Gates said, you know, Europe is demilitarizing. It's the only part of the world that's demilitarizing. Uh, defense budgets are being cut everywhere. People know this. Whoever is the next French president will make defense cuts probably as... as large as the ones going through Britain at the moment. Um, it's not just a question of money, it's also a question of culture. Those of us who were in favor of the EU taking on a role in defense at San Malo in 1998 thought the whole point of it was to persuade other European countries to adopt the approach to the use of force that is shared by Britain and France, namely being prepared to use force to solve security problems. It hasn't worked out that way. As we saw over Libya, there is a small group about a third or a quarter of EU member states who are willing to use force to solve security problems. The others are not. And so the EU as an organization cannot run serious military organizations. My view is you need a smaller defense club led by Britain and France of the willing and able uh, to do that. So th there's a limit to what Europe is able to do, even if it did take Euro Asian security more seriously. The best the Americans could expect in a conflict over, say, Taiwan would be the Europeans to cover for them in the Mediterranean and places close to Europe so that they can deploy those forces to Asia. I don't see Europeans intervening. Um, we do have a strategic partnership with China in the EU. We have strategic partnerships with 10 countries. They are, of course, not strategic at all, by which I mean they're not focused on a, a few important issues. The, the partnership with China covers 80 different platforms and dialogues on social security reform and carbon emissions and all sorts of worthy things, which I think they do some good. So I'm just, at the moment, um, trying to finish a, a little book on Russia, China, and global governance. And in, as part of that work, I've been trying to think about how the EU should manage its strategic partnerships with uh, the likes of, of China. And I have five ideas. Um, basically, the first priority should be focus on global governance, focus on getting China to be, to quote Zelik, a responsible stakeholder. The best thing to do there is to lead by example. So if we have a trade argument with China, take them to the WTO. Don't impose 
sanctions unilaterally. And I'm worried that what's going through Congress now in response to Chinese currency manipulation could actually be illegal, which isn't, isn't a very good of way of persuading the Chinese to take global government seriously. And of course, we do have to make it quite clear that countries such as China, Brazil, India can actually shape, reshape, change the global rules. They're not simply uh, joining a system where we set the rules. The second priority for these partnerships, focus on just a few subjects not have 80 subjects in the relationship. With China, the Europe, Europe should focus on two. Firstly, China should do more to open its markets, uh, stop discriminating against foreign investors. Of course, China is relatively open compared to, say, Japan, but nevertheless, it still mistreats foreign investors increasingly so. Uh, intellectual property rights, public procurement, uh, that kind of thing, uh, bans on banks and lawyer, law firms investing in China. Uh, we, should, we should focus on that. That would be one subject. The second subject, proliferation, as Aaron said, uh, China has a much worse record actually than the Russians on proliferation, uh, transferring nuclear materials to Pakistan, um, uh, you know, North Korea, Iran, and so on. So I think, I think uh, China should be, that should be the second European priority, proliferation. Why doesn't China join the proliferation security initiative as Russia has done? Third priority, um, Stay united, obvious point to make, but the Chinese are very clever, as are the Russians, at dividing and ruling, picking us off one by one because we meet the Dalai Lama in different ways. And if we do have a united position, at least take common messages to China when we go there, then we're more effective, we have more leverage. And linked to this, work with partners, often the Americans, uh, to increase our leverage. We've done this on the so-called Indigenous in Innovation Directive in China, where we work with the Americans, and I think the Japanese, to get the Chinese to modify it. On the Iranian nuclear sanctions, uh, I think we, the Americans and the Europeans, work with the Saudi Arabians to, to help us uh, convince China to, uh, to, to, to move on sanctions against Iran. So work with our partners. Um, fourth priority, um, be willing to bargain. Uh, the EU is very bad at being tough with people uh, and standing up to them. But if we are united, we could be tough. The Chinese want market economy status, sure, they can have market economy status. Why don't they just remove barriers to investment in their own economy? They want us to lift the arms embargo? Well, maybe, maybe we might, but why don't they release several hundred dissidents first? You know, uh, I think we should be prepared to, to bargain on that, those kinds of issues. Uh, and the uh, fifth, fifth principle for strategic partnerships, human rights. My line is we should always talk about human rights. Uh, we should always make clear that if China or other partners abuse human rights, that will affect the quality of the relationship. But we shouldn't predicate the whole relationship on that subject. If China wishes to mistreat its citizens, we in Europe still need to trade and talk to the Chinese about a whole load of other issues, such as climate change, for example. So, um, and probably it's better to focus not on human rights but rule of law. It's a bit less sensitive. The EU does have a program in China training prison wardens, for example, uh, that's the kind of thing where, where we can give direct help. Um, I'm almost at the end of my 10 minutes, but let me just um, finish with a couple of very brief points. Um, in the conclusion of my report on Russia, China, and global governance, I really couldn't make up my mind um, whether China, as it becomes bigger and stronger, is embracing global governance, becoming, uh, becoming a, a more of a responsible stakeholder, or, or rather... As it becomes bigger and stronger, it becomes more unilateralist, a bit like the administration in which Aaron served. You know, who needs global rules when we're big and strong and we're the very tough guys? Uh, maybe we can get our way through acting unilaterally or with allies um, rather than working through slow-moving institutions. And the conclusion I have is that on economic global governance, China is playing by the rules, more or less. It does sort of accept WTO dispute, dispute panelment uh, rulings that go against it. It's sends good people to the IMF and World Bank, takes the G20 seriously. On security, it's nowhere. It does not like security global governance. Russia takes it much more seriously than China does. Uh, but overall, which way China's going, I don't know. Perhaps what, one reason to be a little bit pessimistic is just looking at the economy. Last weekend, I was at, in Venice. Uh, Aspen Strategy Group, Aspen Italia, and the Central Party School organized a conference. And talking to some of the economists there, the Chinese economists who were independent of the government, uh, I'm quite gloomy about China's ability to rebalance its economy. I mean, it's a, to, another subject for another day, but it seems they've, that because the party controls the banks and decides who gets credit, you have a very peculiar misallocation of credit where state-owned enterprises get lots of credit, private sector companies and new startups and new industries do not get credit, 
This is creating huge economic inefficiencies. It prevents consumption growing as it must grow in China. Uh, and it prevents the rebalancing of China to be less export dependent, uh, more consumption dependent, less investment dependent. And the reason why it's so hard to rebalance the Chinese economy is because vested interests, including the party, do not want to rebalance it, even if the 12th five-year plan says we should rebalance it. Now, if my pessimistic analysis that it's going to be hard to rebalance is correct, then China will grow slowly. There'll be more unrest, more discontent, more paranoia, more blaming the West for China's ills, and China will be a less responsible stakeholder, and it's more likely to behave unilaterally and become the kind of dangerous, dangerous power that I guess Aaron says we need to, to ensure against. Very last word on can China save the EU? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, just to recount one, one comment from Venice last week, and I asked Mr. Lee, the head of the Central Party School, you know, would you be prepared to uh, put money into the EFSF bailout fund? He said, we always like to help friends in need. Uh, we want the EU to succeed. We want it to be part of a multipolar world order. Uh, but, of course, you'd have to give us market economy status, and he implied we'd have to stop criticising them on other things too. So I think it would be very dangerous to take China's gold uh, in that respect. Uh, I wouldn't advise Europeans to do it. Sarkozy's made a bit of a prat of himself by publicly saying that we need it. Uh, we don't need it. The money's in Europe. It's just the mm. European governments have to decide to give it. And I think the Chinese have probably got too much sense to invest uh, in Greece. Where they can help is investing in particular infrastructure projects, but not in bailout funds. I'll stop there. Charles, thank you very much. Well, um, I think you agree that between our two speakers, you know, we've, we've had uh, you know, a pretty uh, rich um, diet of uh, thought-provoking um, activity, you know, thought-provoking thought uh, statements. Uh, we've got just over half an hour to talk. I can see uh, hands uh, um, racing up. I'll take uh, Dana Allen first, please. I think you were first, Dana. And you're yeah. probably going to ask a question, otherwise I would have asked, but go ahead. Aaron and Charles, thank you very much. Um, uh, both brilliant. Um, Aaron, I wonder if I could, I think you telegraphed that you were reaching your limit on speculation about what China wanted to do with supremacy. But I want to ask you a little bit more because, um, I mean, you say, for example, make the world safe for authoritarians. The world is pretty safe for authoritarians right now, I would observe. Um, there's limits. I mean, there, there was a movement in the Bush administration to imagine that we were going to um, make them scarcer. Um, I'm not sure that's happened. Uh, the question is whether that's a fundamental threat to us. Um, you know, during the Cold War, I mean, you could argue about it, but there was a reasonable case to be made that if um, the Soviet Union achieved hegemony over Western Europe, it would be a, a kind of linear trend to, um, to threatening democracy. Um, is that what Chinese supremacy in East Asia would lead to? Well, I, uh, I was irresistibly tempted by the phrase making the world safe for authoritarianism. Uh, maybe I, be, partly because I teach at the Woodrow Wilson School, so uh, it, it has a familiar echo. Um, I don't want to overstate this. I don't think uh, that the current Chinese regime sees itself as having a mission to propagate its <clears throat> point of view, which of course is very different from the Soviet and different from China in a previous incarnation. Uh, however, I think they do see themselves as having an interest in supporting other governments which are being isolated and pressured, not only by the United States, but by the West more generally, whether it's because they're violating the human rights of their citizens, as countries in Africa are doing, or because they're developing nuclear weapons, as uh, Iran is doing. So I think the growth of Chinese power and influence is going to make it possible for states that otherwise might have found themselves increasingly isolated to hold out against those pressures, which I think overall is, is not a good thing. Um, as far as uh, what happens in East Asia is concerned, I don't think, again, that uh, the Chinese regime has territorial expansionist goals beyond controlling all of the, uh, the South China Sea, which is not a trivial thing, and regaining Taiwan, which is also not trivial. Uh, but I think it has a desire to exert a dominant political influence, essentially to have a veto over what goes on in that region. 
uh, and that it believes that it's entitled to that and also will be able to exercise that in the long run if the United States is no longer active in the ways that it is now. Uh, I think uh, the current Chinese regime doesn't want to have, for example, any countries on its immediate frontier uh, that are democratic. It has to put up with Mongolia uh, and India, but behind big ma mountain barriers. But beyond that, I think that the role that they're going to play in their immediate neighborhood is going to be very supportive of regimes that are also authoritarian uh, because they believe that they'll be able to control them and they'll be able to limit the possibility of ideological uh, infiltration that might otherwise come across those frontiers. Uh, so I think overall that's, that's not a good thing. Uh, that's not a good thing for the region. It's not a good thing for the world. And it's not a good thing for the country's other now advanced industrial democracies in Asia like Japan and Korea uh, and Australia either to be in that kind of a situation on their own having to deal with China one by one rather than united as they are now and with the assistance of the United States. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Edwina Morden, uh, next. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question mostly addressed to Charles, but perhaps Aaron too. Um, Charles, I would agree with your pessimistic analysis of what the Europeans are currently doing, but I would disagree that that's the best way for them to use their um, mental energies uh, for two reasons. Um, one is that, um, well, three perhaps. One is that you know, in a world that thinks globally, you're advocating that Europe thinks geographically and regionally, and I think that leads to two problems. One we saw over the arms embargo issue. When you're not thinking strategically about the world, you end up making mistakes. And the European Union found itself in the position of having its person, uh, its representative on Capitol Hill, arguing to Congress that it was okay for the Europeans to lift the arms embargo on China on the very day that the Chinese parliament passed the law that said they could invade Taiwan whenever they liked, pretty much. So it leads you to strategic mistakes, which are deeply embarrassing. But there's another reason, which is that if you added up the amount of trade and investment that America does in Asia, and you added up the amount of trade and investment that Europeans do in Asia, the figures are pretty similar. And so the idea that Europe can some, somehow bury its head in European sands and leave Asia to everybody else seems to me to be fundamentally mistaken. I'd be very interested in re your reaction to that and also ask Aaron, what would be the response in the U.S. if that turned out to be the future? Do you want to take that first? Yeah. Um, well, I, I absolutely agree, Edwina. Of course, the Europeans should think as strategically as possible about Asia. They happen to have appointed an extremely good man called Marcus Edera to be the first EU ambassador, uh, a very senior German uh, in Beijing. Um, the trouble is that, I, that the Europeans do have an economic focus when they think about Asia. Uh, which is it's certainly regrettable, but it probably means that we're too optimistic. Um, I think a point that uh, Aaron makes in his book is that a lot of people in the US are too optimistic because they're focused on trade and commerce. And uh, certainly if you read, say, John Eikenbury, a liberal internationalist thinker on China, he's, he thinks China will become a responsible great stakeholder because it's economic interest dictate that it should do so. But then if you read Bob Kagan, he thinks that China is uh, going to be very unilateralist and, and behave in a kind of aggressive, nasty way towards many of its neighbours. That's because I can be looked at the economics and Kagan looks at security. And I think because the Europeans focus on economics, they, um, they're probably a little, bit, a little bit optimistic about what's happening in Asia. <coughs> that point. Well, I, I agree with you very much. I, I think there may be limits. There are limits on what Europe can do uh, in, in Asia beyond the economic sphere, uh, but I think it's important to think about the problem strategically in part because I think there are opportunities uh, for closer cooperation among the democratic countries, not only in Asia, but also in Europe and the United States, and that we have certain common interests, or we ought to, and common concerns that transcend the economic issues. Uh, uh, when Charles was listing his five points, I, I came up with four. I don't know if that makes it better or worse, uh, but what, as an American, what would I like to see from Europe on the issue of China and Asia? And I would state them in the following way. The first is do no harm, because there are things, you mentioned the EU arms embargo, that Europe could do that would be very damaging, uh, because there are technologies that China would like to have access to that doesn't presently, uh, 
uh, which it could get if the arms embargo were lifted. Uh, and even more, I think the, uh, the conflict that you referred to or the near uh, collision that you referred to between the United States and Europe on this issue five or six years ago could be repeated if that were to be, uh, if that issue were, were to be raised again. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, it echoes Charles' point on staying united. I think it's extremely important that China hear not only from the United States, not only from Japan, not only from countries in its region, but from all the democratic countries, similar things about its policies and its behavior. I think it's important to reinforce the sense that it would be very difficult and counterproductive for China to try to divide uh, European countries from one another, to divide Europe from the United States, and I think that's something they would like to do uh, for their own reasons, but they need to be dissuaded from that. Uh, third, I think there are opportunities for cooperation on a number of issues of common concern. The trade issue is one. Uh, people in the U.S. are very concerned about currency valuation and China's policies in that regard, but this is a problem for many countries, including countries in Europe, and so there is common uh, cause to be made there. I think also on the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, there all of the countries of the advanced industrial world uh, have suffered the consequences of cyber penetration and cyber espionage, much of it originating in China, uh, and there's grounds for greater cooperation and unity in dealing with that issue. The last thing I would mention uh, is uh, hedging. I think that individual European countries, maybe Britain in particular, uh, aren't going to be present militarily in, in Asia. I have concerns closer to home and, of course, have problems in maintaining the force levels and, and budgets. Uh, but they can do things with third parties in the region to help them strengthen their position. Uh, dialogue with India and with other countries uh, and, frankly, arms sales. And there's some of that that's going on already. Uh, but the countries, for example, around the South China Sea need an increased capacity to defend themselves and to defend their territorial waters and airspace. Uh, and they may want, they, some of them clearly do, want to buy more advanced systems, uh, and they may come to the United States for that. They may go to Japan for that if Japan lifts its export ban, but they're certainly going to come to Europe for that, uh, and I would think that would be a good thing because it would contribute to a, a balance. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll take a question in the front row here, please, uh, Lady Kenneth, I think. Um, thank you. Elizabeth Young, otherwise of Lady Kennett. Um, human rights, it is only a very short time that in the United States discrimination has been got rid of. Um, I think we can expect developments in China after all they've seemed largely to have coped with the matter of famine. And that's a beginning, that's one important thing. The other point that I'd like to make is, does the United States hope to secure military supremacy over China? Um, there is the global missile defense system being set up now, um, which in the Middle East is clearly intended against Iran, in Europe too, but it looks to the Russians as if it's intended against them. And it's not being discussed properly with them at the moment. In the Far East, it's obviously against China. This is a global system being proposed in which Europe would have a role, obviously. Japan, South Korea would have roles. Does the United States hope to secure superiority this way, forgetting, presumably, that the other, the intended um, the state against which missile defenses are being erected is only too likely to go on developing their own missiles, etc. This is already happening in China. 
and we see all of our, for instance, being regularly rather conspicuously tested in Russia. This is an arms race. Is it an arms race that the United States can hope to win? Okay, two questions there, human rights and uh, an arms race. On so. human rights, um, uh, I would say uh, it is the, not only the case that it's recently, uh, that there have been relatively recent improvements in, uh, in human rights or, or discrimination in the United States. That's a process that's incomplete in the United States. It's also incomplete in Europe. However, the fundamental principles on which the United States and the democratic countries of Europe are founded uh, embody the defense of those rights and liberties. And that is not the case in the current regime in China. Uh, regarding uh, family, I'm not sure what you mean there. Uh, the famine, okay. Famine, yes, great progress uh, in, in raising uh, China's people out of, uh, out of poverty, and that's, uh, that's an enormous advance. I don't think it's an excuse for <clears throat> continued abuses of, of human rights and, and, and shouldn't be. Uh, military supremacy over China, missile defense, uh, I think the focus and the concern in the Asia Pacific has been in recent years uh, not so much long-range nuclear missiles but shorter range conventional ballistic missiles of which China is procuring very large numbers. Uh, and if uh, China is concerned about the possibility that company, uh, countries like Japan might cooperate with the United States or Taiwan in developing defenses against ballistic missiles, uh, conventional ballistic missiles, they have to look in the mirror and ask why that might be the case. And I think part of the answer is they've placed a great deal of emphasis on building up uh, their missile capabilities for their own reason, and the defense is a response to that. Uh, military supremacy, uh, I think the United States is intent on maintaining its military superiority uh, in certain domains, and I would say in particular in the maritime domain. The United States has for a long time uh, believed that it was important for either for the United States or another democratic country like Britain to be the dominant naval power, uh, and I don't think that we're going to willingly give that up if the alternative is to cede it to, to China or another non-democratic country. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Nicholas, um, second row there, please. If, if I could ask a couple of quick questions. The first on the Korean Peninsula. If eventually uh, North Korea does collapse and you have a united Korea, uh, democratic united Korea, does the United States uh, need to give some guarantees and reassurance to China that there wouldn't be uh, American troops on the Yellow River, for instance. The second question, um, China's rise, China's success, means that in many areas China's beginning to become a have rather than a have not power. Does that mean that there is a shift in some of the ideological traditions such as non-interference or the use of force internationally uh, if China is beginning to look at the need to defend its investments in uh, parts of the developing world? Right. Thank you. Let me take the second question first, and it relates to something Charles second raised at the end, uh, this question of which direction China is going. My own expectation is that, in fact, again, China as currently ruled, uh, is adhering to certain norms of international conduct, not out of a belief in the, uh, in the principle as such, but because it sees doing so as being in its interest. Uh, so China is a prime defender of traditional conceptions of sovereignty and very much opposed to Western-led interventions in countries like Libya on, on grounds of principle, I think that reflects a long-standing anxiety and concern on the part of China's leaders that they themselves might be vulnerable to intervention. I would expect that as China's power grows, its adherence to that principle will be modified and that China will find ways to justify intervention itself where it sees that being, as being in its interests. Uh, and, as you mentioned, China's interests are growing and expanding. Uh, it would be very surprising if China didn't see the capabilities to defend some of those, uh, of those interests. So I think the, the, what we're going to see is a movement away from the commitment to some of the principles that China currently uh, declares. Regarding uh, Korea, um, I think that uh, Chinese views on this have changed somewhat. I think at one time, 
there might have been a hope and an expectation that China could put itself in the position of being the broker of the eventual unification of the peninsula, uh, able to communicate both with North and South, and perhaps to set the terms of unification, which might include a withdrawal of U.S. forces or an end to the U.S. ROK alliance. It seems more recently that they've moved towards a position of trying to develop uh, deeper economic connections and interests, at least in the northern parts of North Korea. Uh, and I know in South Korea, people are very concerned that China has no intention in the long run of supporting full unification, but is actually uh, going to is assert de facto control over parts of, of the North. Um, I think you know, from an American perspective, there would be no interest or, or need to put U.S. forces need near to China's frontier. I think people know that this is neither necessary uh, nor wise. On the other hand, I don't think we should be negotiating over the heads of our alliance partners the future structure of our alliance uh, with a third party. Um, some of those discussions, I think people in the U.S. have actually tried to engage the Chinese in conversation on this, and they've been deeply reluctant to talk about it, presumably because they worry that it will damage their already difficult relations with North Korea. Thanks very much. Charles, you wanted to pick just, up on just the second Just pick up point. on the point about non-interference. I mean, I, I hope Aaron's right. Uh, it's very hard to tell if China is modifying its hostility to intervention. I mean, I, I don't see much evidence of it yet. On Ivory Coast, interestingly, um, f after Bagbo was re-elected fraudul fraudulently about a year ago, um, at the United Nations Security Council, China was willing to criticize Bagbo because the African Union was critical of him. And Russia was stood by Bagbo, actually. Uh, and then in the end, after Bagbo started shooting too many UN soldiers, uh, the Russians relented. And the, the UNSC passed a resolution which allowed France to go and bomb Bagbo, and he was out. Um, so there, China sort of indicated a little bit of softening of its principles. And then, of course, it did um, abstain on the Libya Resolution 1973, uh, as Russia did. Um, some Chinese academics say that signals a new approach to, to, uh, to, towards accepting a greater degree of interference in other countries' affairs. But then China, like Russia, has been pretty annoyed, perhaps less angry than Russia, about the so-called abuse of 1973, that it was used by the West to, to take sides in the civil war. And on Syria, they've been with the Russians in blocking all UNSC resolutions. Um, so it's a little bit hard, hard to read. I guess in the long run, the logic is, Aaron must be right logically, as they develop global interests, they will want to intervene to protect their own interests or their own people in various parts of the world. Let, let's hope it goes that way. Just don't see much evidence yet. Okay. Thanks very much. I think a gentleman in the third row there was, yeah, uh, could we? Thank you, Chair. Um, name is Mahmoud Ali. I'm just a member of the Institute. Question primarily addressed to Professor Friedberg. Um, I wonder what policy recommendations you are planning to or offering to advance to ensure the continuation of the extension of America's systemic primacy into the indefinite future so that the fear that you have raised in your book doesn't actually come to pass. And given the experience of the bipartisan commission in Congress now trying to reduce debt, reach an agreement on that, their experience is not particularly sort of optimistic um, to say the, say the least. Given that experience, how realistic would these recommendations be? And the reverse of that coin must be, how amenable is China, do you think, uh, to being contained or constrained? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. We might, uh, because there's still quite a few hands going up, we might take one more question, which is, uh, I'll take that one in the second row there, please. Uh, thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Andrzej Swidlicki from uh, Polish News Agency. Uh, one area that you didn't touch up on is the energy. So the question is, to what degree is China's need for imported energy, especially oil and gas, determining its uh, foreign policy? And what prospect there is for um, cooperation in energy between Russia and China? Thank you. Aaron? Okay. Um, no, I, on, the, on the first set of questions, uh, I don't advocate containment of China. Uh, I am in favor of policies that are intended to maintain a balance of power that's favorable to the interests of the U.S. and other democratic countries. That's not the same as containment. The United States practiced a policy of containment towards China in the 1950s and 1960s, and it looked very different. Uh, and 
we're engaging with China and we're, uh, as a result, assisting in its development in all kinds of significant ways. If we were out to contain China, we wouldn't be doing those things. Budget constraints, you mentioned, are very important. I think in the near term, they're going to impose limits on what the United States can afford to spend on defense and on other things. Uh, but I think it's important not to overstate this. Uh, the United States has a, uh, a liquidity problem, uh, which it will resolve over time, and it will grow and reduce the size of its debt and narrow the size of its budget deficit. Uh, I think it would be a serious mistake for others, maybe in particular in China, to believe that the U.S. is now in decline and on, on the way out uh, as a world power. I just don't believe that. Uh, we've been through a number of cycles uh, in the recent past, and the, uh, the end result has been continued U.S. economic growth and a major uh, U.S. military role in the world. I don't know that that's something that uh, the American people want for its own sake. Uh, but I think people have come to believe that that's essential for American interests and also for uh, the interests of other uh, countries for the U.S. to continue to be strong. I think there's also demand for a, a continued major U.S. role, certainly in Asia. Uh, I think there is more of an interest in seeing the United States remain and indeed strengthen its role there on the part of a wide swath of countries now than there has been ever before and it's a reflection of concerns over China. So it's not just the U.S. push, it's the pull from others that are concerned about China. Oil and gas uh, and desire for access to resources, very important driver in Chinese economic policy, I think also increasingly in its military policy. Uh, China is in a position of being increasingly dependent on imports uh, that come by the sea lanes, uh, and at the moment they have only a limited capacity to defend uh, those lines of communication, and the United States remains the dominant naval power. Um, that's not a bad thing, I think, uh, from an American and Western perspective, because I think the prospect of being denied access to those resources is a major deterrent on any possibility of aggression uh, by China. Are there possibilities for cooperative development? Certainly, um, and Chinese have been pursuing this with Russia uh, and have made gains there, but I think the Russians have become a little more leery of allowing themselves to be locked into a relationship where China is their sole customer uh, because they realize that that may put them at a disadvantage. So they've been looking to diversify their customers and to build pipelines that don't all end up in China, uh, and I think that that trend is going to continue. China is looking in all directions, over land and over water, for access to energy. There are possibilities for cooperative development also, for example, in the South China Sea uh, with other countries that have claims. Uh, but those prospects are going to remain unfulfilled if China insists on its current position of claiming uh, the right to control all of the, all of the resources of the region. Now, Charles, you want to pick up on the energy? Brief word on energy. I think energy is hugely important for Chinese foreign policy. It must be one of the reasons why they are more reluctant than Russia to get tough on Iran. And it may explain some of the policies on Sudan. It may explain why they've taken this very assertive line on the South China Sea. Um, the 12 five year plan has some very uh, interesting and, and bold targets on greater energy efficiency on reducing the energy intensity of the Chinese economy. And I'm told these targets are binding, unlike those in the 11th five-year plan. I'm not quite sure what binding means there, but they certainly take energy efficiency very seriously. They are the world's biggest producer of windmills and solar power panels. They're doing much more than Americans are doing to make their economy more energy efficient, uh, and more than some Europeans as well. They're also very interested in shale gas, of course, which is transforming the world energy markets. They've probably got a lot of shale gas. This would make them much less dependent on imports. Um, on the Russia-China, if you go to Gazprom's Mo Moscow headquarters and you look at the big map they have on the wall of all their pipelines, not one gas pipeline goes east. They all go west. They've been, the Russians have been talking to the Chinese about sending gas east for many years. It hasn't happened. It's not going to happen for a while because the Chinese won't pay the very high prices that the Europeans pay. It's as simple as that. Now, Turkmen gas is going east, but it's through a pipe, but it's, and, and there's an oil pipe now between yeah. Russia and China, but not a gas pipe. It's very interesting, given, given that Russia is an energy superpower and given China's energy needs, how little they trade in energy. Okay, thanks very much. The gentleman right at the back there, and then uh, in the third row on the, you know, my right-hand side. 
Yeah. Look, uh, Peter Norman, um, I was just wondering if you could speak his thoughts on economic warfare and how seriously China takes this compared to the West and just the comparison between the two. Okay, thank you. And the gentleman there in the third row, please. Yeah, yes. Yeah. No, no, third row. Jonathan katz and freelance journalist. Um, one uh, aspect of this, um, of the contest for supremacy that you haven't really addressed is the one that really makes it um, completely different to most others, particularly during the Cold War. Here you have the West and China completely bound to each other through the economic ties. Through economic ties. One is hostage to another in many respects. Um, and thinking about this really puts, it, it puts a, great, a tremendous constraint on the actions that the US and Europe can take towards China and also vice versa. If you could address those points, thank you. Well, it's certainly different than the Cold War. It's not different than Europe in the late 19th and early 20th century when Britain and Germany were one another's leading trading partners and investment partners. And in that case, economic interdependence didn't prevent conflict. I hope that economic interdependence will in this case, but it's by no means a guarantee, and historically it has not been a guarantee. Um, on economic warfare, I guess uh, it depends, I suppose, on, on what you mean. Um, Chinese attitudes on um, economics are a mix of market ideas that are very familiar in the West and some uh, that seem to more closely resemble mercantilist thinking. Um, there is concern about economic warfare as practiced potentially by other countries in the form of sanctions and so on, but there's also increasing interest in the possibility that China may have economic leverage of its own to use. Uh, I don't think that that thinking is necessarily very far advanced or very sophisticated, but you do now periodically hear Chinese government officials, not just academics or journalists saying, if the United States does X or doesn't do Y, perhaps we should stop buying U.S. Treasury bonds and that will really show them. Well, that's a very dangerous idea uh, and would be very damaging to China uh, as well as to the United States and the rest of the world economy. Um, one area that I think is uh, interesting and a little bit concerning uh, is uh, the rare earth minerals in which China has, at least for the moment, uh, developed a monopoly in production in a number of these, and they're very important for high-end electronic uh, manufacturing. Uh, and at least in the case of the confrontation with Japan in 2010, China reportedly uh, suspended exports of these materials to Japan for a period of time as a way of exerting some pressure over Japan to get it to uh, change its its uh, diplomatic stance in this controversy over the arrest of a Chinese fishing boat captain. That got people's attention, certainly in Japan and, and, and I think also in the United States. I don't think uh, other countries want to be in a position where they're dependent on China in particular uh, for access to materials that they need for high-end uh, manufacturing. And there's a lot of activity going on both in Japan and in the U.S. and I think elsewhere to develop alternative sources to reduce that dependence. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've got time for two more questions, provided they're both brief and end in a question mark. The gentleman in the back row and then in the uh, uh, second from back, please. Sorry, third from back. Third from back. Thank you. Uh, ben Trembilski, University of Leiden, the Netherlands. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, U.S.-China uh, relations on the Iranian question. There was an article recently in Foreign Policy magazine that suggested that uh, while Chinese-Iranian trade has gone up this year probably to $40 billion from $30 billion last year, and that it's, not, uh, that it's not just an exchange of Iranian energy resources for Iranians shopping in the Chinese arms bazaar, but that it is in fact more deliberate attempts on China's part to uh, a strategic effort to uh, counter American strategic interests in the Middle East. Um, do you recognize this point? And second, uh, do you think that this is maybe a, uh, a means of trying to draw away American attention from Asia, the way you have uh, suggested in your speech? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll take the gentleman in the, in the second from back row and then the third in back. And you'll, so that's three questions in all, if that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. Okay, right. And please, please be brief. George Harnett, Record Currency Management and member of IISS. 
Do you see a risk in the changeover in leadership next year in hardening Chinese attitudes, or as an opportunity for a new relationship? Thank you. And uh, if you can pass it to the next row, please. Thank you. I'm Aaron Schroeder Willis, University of Cambridge. I wonder if our speakers could comment on uh, China, Chinese-Russian relations, and uh, presumably at the moment uh, Ch Russia sees an interest in allying with China on, say, the Uni United Nations Security Council. But as it declines in power relative to China, will it see an interest in opening up a united front, say, with the West, and a uh, relaxation of tensions with uh, the EU and uh, the United States? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Admiral Brevity. I'll do mainly the last one. Thank you. Okay. Charles, would you like to You want to do the last one first? Yeah, okay, okay. okay. sure. Um, on China Russia relations. Well, you know, super fit, well, China Russia relations are probably the best they've been in the history of, of China and Russia. There's lots of trade, joint military exercises. They team up at the UN in opposing color revolutions and liberal interventionism. But of course, underneath the surface, there's great mistrust. Um, just to report a conversation I had in Russia recently, which I think is significant. Uh, there has been a kind of reset between Russia and China in, in that they've sort of, the reset is that Russia's accepted that it's no longer the dominant part, partner and China's accepted that it must give Russia equality. That's the basis on which the relationship operates now. But the Russians see that so long as the Chinese economy continues to grow twice as fast as the Russia's, Russian economy, the economic gap between them is so great that that the Russians fear that in five or ten years they will no longer have this kind of equality. And that already the Chinese, as the Russians know perfectly well, are quite contemptuous about them behind their back. They think the Russians mismanage their economy. Uh, the Russians are more and more worried about China, which is one of the reasons why in the last two or three years they've been softer towards the US and to Europe, because they, they feel the need to, to sort of play that against, against China. Um, the Chinese are worried that this reset with the US will lead Russia to be more pro-Western in geostrategic matters. They see this on the Iran dossier. The Russians have a worry that, that, that we're moving towards a G2 world where Russia doesn't feature, feature at all. So a very, very interesting relationship. Thank you. We'll start with that one as well. I agree with what Charles has said. I think there's growing concern in Russia about the future relationship with China uh, because Russia is clearly the, the weaker partner and growing weaker in relation to China. What that suggests to me in the long run is that China and Russia are not natural allies. Uh, to the contrary, uh, Russia, in the long run, Russia's interests, it seems to me, lie to the West and improving relations with the West. Now, that's there are limits on how far that's going to go, given the current character of the Russian regime. But I think in the long run, uh, certainly the United States, European powers should do nothing that unnecessarily pushes Russia into China's arms. To the contrary, it should be, uh, there should be an attempt to draw Russia, Russia closer to, to the West and away from China. Um, on Iran-China relations, uh, complicated relationship, a growing relationship. Uh, I think it does go beyond economics. Uh, there's certainly an interest on China's part in gaining access to energy. Uh, there's also an interest, and they have for some time, selling weapons to Iran. But I think uh, in a world in which China is likely to be increasingly dependent on energy exports from the Persian Gulf, uh, it's likely that China will look to play a bigger strategic role, a bigger military role uh, in, in the region. That's what the United States has done for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if Russia, uh, if China attempts it too. Uh, that may lead to problems and, and frictions. I don't know if it's intended to deflect American interests from Asia, uh, but I think it is intended in part to position China to take advantage of the possibility that the United States is going to play less of a role in the Gulf, and China may have an opportunity to play a bigger role. India, among others, will not like this and will contest it. Um, what the implications of the change in leadership are going to be, we don't, we don't know. Uh, you know on balance, uh, the safest thing to predict is the future will be similar to the past, at least in the short run. But I do think there is some reason to believe that the character of the Chinese domestic system is changing uh, in ways that could be problematic and troublesome uh, for the rest of the world. Um, increase in nationalism, uh, as a tool for mobilizing popular support and deflecting uh, resentment away from the regime, uh, a rising generation of leaders, not the people who will take power next year, but those coming up behind them who have known nothing but China's success, uh, who believe uh, 
China's time has come and it may be in favor of more assertive policies, not necessarily a bad thing, but could lead to collision with other countries. And also the growing role of, of the PLA, of Chinese military, in Chinese politics and in the shaping of China's policies overall. Uh, the military has been fed a diet, a very rich diet of resources over the last 20 years. It's grown in size and significance, and we've seen recently uh, the willingness on the part of some high-level uh, Chinese military officers to express views on policy, but not only on policy, to express views critical of the civilian leadership, which is something that we haven't seen before, saying the civilians are not only soft, but corrupt. Uh, and I'm concerned that China's policies may be shaped increasingly by uh, its military. Aaron, thank you very much, and thanks uh, to both our speakers. Um, I think you all agree that uh, the uh, U.S.-China relationship is, is, is you know, one of the key strategic relationships which is going to dominate uh, and, and direct the way in which you know, the world evolves uh, for, for uh, a number of uh, decades to come at the very least. You know, this, this, this raises some you know, difficult um, questions, um, but because they're difficult, um, all the more reason to address them and all the more reason to apply to these questions, you know, top quality um, critical thinking and analysis, and I think you will agree that our two speakers have amply uh, achieved that objective with uh, some very um, varied, rich, and thought-provoking observations. Thank you both, and please join me in thanking you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, very good. I'm not sure I agree with you about